Okay, so we're looking at the life of um, Joseph over January. And it's, as I've been saying, it's a great story about God's providence. God's providence. Uh, that means that God works out every little detail according to his plan. Everything that happens, everything that takes place is according to God's plan. And I've actually heard it said by someone, I, I can't remember who, but um, they said that the story of Joseph is like one big illustration of that famous verse in Romans 8.28, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, uh, who have been called according to his purpose. Okay, in all things, God works for the good. We've been seeing that in Joseph's life, that horrible things happened to him, and yet through those horrible things, God was doing a good work, not only for Joseph, but for the entire world. And uh, last week, we looked at the um, turning point in this incredible story, where Joseph went from being um, stuck in a prison to now being prime minister over Egypt. So that was the turning point. Today we come to the climax of the story. And uh, we're going to look at it. Uh, I've just got three points this morning. Uh, we're going to look at the plot, uh, the, the tests, and the meaning. So the plot, the tests, and the meaning. Um, so first, let's, let's look at the plot. It's a big section, uh, four chapters, and so we need to get our minds around um, what actually happens in this section. That's why it's called uh, the plot. Uh, so four chapters, Joseph is now Prime Minister, and Joseph's main task as Prime Minister was to make Egypt a relief centre for a, a famine that had, that had gripped and devastated the whole known world. Egypt was the relief centre. And uh, Joseph was in charge of all of that. And in chapter 42, we learn that Jacob and his family, way back in Canaan, they're also going through the famine. And so the brothers are sent off to Egypt, the ten older brothers, sent off to Egypt to buy food off the very one they sold there in the first place. So the ten older brothers head off. Uh, they, and when they get there... Uh, what do you know? They bow down before the Prime Minister, who is actually Joseph. And um, Joseph, when he sees them, he recognises them instantly. Okay? But they don't recognise him. But when he sees them bowing down like that, it says in verse 9, he remembered his dreams about them. And uh, Joseph recognises them. They don't recognise him. And that actually makes sense, doesn't it? Because when they saw Joseph last, he was a teenager. They were all grown adult men, so they probably didn't look too different. Uh, but Joseph, he, he's heaps different. And not only that, he was the Prime Minister of Egypt. So you can imagine he would be dressed and styled in a, a very different way to um, how they had seen him last. We're also told in um, verse th uh, 23 in um, chapter 42, that um, whenever Joseph spoke to them, he used an interpreter. And that's why they didn't recognise him. And Joseph plays on the fact that they didn't recognise him. And he, it says he spoke harshly to them. He accuses them of being spies. And they all say, no, 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 we're, we're all one family. We're all brothers. Uh, they say, our youngest brother is now with our father. And one is no more. And Joseph says, no, you're spies. And to prove that you're telling the truth, you need to go back home and bring that youngest son to me. Then I'll believe that you're not spies. To, to help them realise that he meant business, he threw them in jail for three days. Then after those three days, he drags them all out, sends them home with grain. You know, he doesn't want Jacob to die in the meantime. Uh, he sends them home. But he keeps Simeon in jail as a hostage to make sure that they come back. And uh, so there's Joseph. He's messing with their minds, messing around with them. And uh, even when he sends them back, those nine brothers with the grain, uh, to go back and get Benjamin, even then he messes with them because he puts their money back in their uh, grain bags. And so when they get home and they open the bags and they see the money, 
It says that their hearts melted with fear because all of a sudden, you know, they've already been accused of being spies. Now they're thinking, we're going to be accused of actually stealing this grain. And so they think, this is a disaster. There's no hope. We're all goners. You know, there's a famine. And they are so distressed at this point. Jacob especially is so distressed. And he just says to them, look, there is no way that you are ever taking Benjamin back to Egypt. Things get desperate, though. They run out of food again. And they get to a point where there's just no option. Jacob has no option. He has to let Benjamin go. And so the brothers head off to Egypt for a second time. When they arrive, uh, Joseph, again, pretends to be a stranger. But this time... He has them around for a meal and that really confuses them. This harsh, powerful prime minister is now inviting them home for a meal and uh, he, at that meal he almost blows his cover because when he looks at his youngest brother Benjamin, you know that's his full brother, he looks at him <laughs> and it says in chapter 43 verse 30, uh, it's very moving, he says <clears throat> Verse 30, deeply moved at the sight of his brother, Joseph hurried out and looked for a place to weep. He went into his private room and wept there. Uh, Then he pulls himself together, goes back out, you know, puts his harsh face on, goes back out and has uh, the meal with them. However, when it's time for the brothers to go back home, again, with their bags full of grain, this time he arranges to have his silver cup put into Benjamin's grain bag. Then he arranges one of his servants, after the brothers have left, to race off after them, to to stop them in their journey and say, someone has stolen my master's cup. And they all say, what are you talking about? There is no way we would do anything like that. And so the, the servant begins searching each of the bags and he's very clever. Joseph obviously had it all worked out. He begins with the oldest brother and works through one by one and after those first ten older brothers they're all feeling, you know, we're all safe until finally he opens Benjamin's bag, digs around and pulls out the cup. Can you imagine the shock the brothers would have felt at that point? What a disaster. And so they all get dragged back before Joseph. They fall down before Joseph and they say, we are your slaves. And jo- but Joseph says, no, no, only the man who was found to have the cup will become my slave. The rest of you can go home to your father in peace. And at that point, Judah, of all the brothers, steps forward and makes the most moving and the most compelling speech ever, that Joseph can't hold it together anymore. And he breaks down weeping. He was weeping so loud that it could be heard across the road. And even Pharaoh heard about it. And then he finally says, I am Joseph. Is my father okay? And all the brothers, they are absolutely speechless. Eventually, they pick their jaws up off the ground, go over and embrace him, and it says they all weep over him. And then finally, Joseph invites them all back to live in Egypt. Okay, that's the plot. That's the storyline. And it is an incredible story. In fact, the way it's written... uh, Did anyone do the, um, the Bible reading plan last year? And we're reading through Genesis, and you get to this point, and you just want to keep reading... It's just so exciting. It's really fantastic literature. All of these twists and turns. But it does leave us with a question. The question of this passage is, why does Joseph do all all of those things he does? Why does he mess with their minds, the brothers' minds? Why Why doesn't he just come out and tell them who he is at the beginning? Why does he put them through all of this pain and agony and, and uh, you know, back and forward, back and forward? Why does he mess around with them like this? Why not just come out and say, hey, brothers, it's me. 
And see, a lot of people, when they read this um, section in, in Joseph's life, they actually think that Joseph has been vindictive, that he is being vengeful. Uh, they think that what, the reason Joseph puts his brothers through all of this trouble is to get his revenge on them. No, they put him in a pit, they sold him as a slave, and so now he's going to get back at them for doing all of that to him. Yeah, sure, he's going to tell them who he is, but not until he first has a bit of fun with them. Teach them a lesson for causing him so much pain. And so lots of people think that that's what Joseph is doing here. But the reality is nothing could be further from the truth. Joseph is not being vindictive. He is not seeking revenge here. If Joseph wanted revenge for what his brothers did to him, he could have just had them all killed on the spot. That's what revenge is. You know, you do that to me, I do this to you. That's revenge. And Joseph could have done that, but he doesn't. Joseph is not even seeking justice here. Joseph, if, if he wanted justice for what his brothers did to him, what is a just punishment for selling someone into slavery and then being locked up in prison for years? What is a just punishment for that? It's slavery and, and jail for years. And Joseph could have easily done that. As soon as he saw the brothers, he could have said, guards, put those fellows in jail. They're going to be slaves for the next 22 years. But Joseph doesn't do that. He's not interested in justice either. There's something else going on here. Why does Joseph put them through all of this trouble? And here's the reason. What Joseph is doing here is he is putting his brothers through a series of tests. It's a series of tests. And the tests are carefully arranged for one purpose. The purpose is to see if reconciliation with his brothers is possible. That's what he's doing. He's putting these, his brothers through tests to see if reconciliation is possible. In other words, can they be a family once again? Can they talk to each other once again? Joseph didn't want to get back at his brothers. He wanted to get back with his brothers. And that's what he's doing. And so he arranges, he arranges these tests to see if that is possible. Uh, you know, he wants to know, um, do, do they feel any remorse for what they did to him? Uh, do they, well, are, are they willing to change? Have they changed their attitudes? Are they willing to? And if Joseph had just come out at the beginning and said, hey, fellas, look who it is. Of course they would have shown remorse. <laughs> they would have been down on their faces. Oh, so sorry, so sorry. Please forgive us. Why? Because Joseph is now powerful. And he can do anything to them. And they can't stop him. And so of course they would have shown remorse. But Joseph doesn't just want to see them groveling before him. He wants to see changed hearts. And so that's why he puts them through this, these tests. He wants to see what they're really like. Have they changed? Are they willing to change? And do you realise that, that that is actually vital to know? Because without that kind of change, there cannot be reconciliation. You can't have reconciliation between two parties that have fallen out unless there's change. Okay, now that's different to forgiveness. If someone sins against you, you must forgive them. Okay, you are commanded to forgive them. If you don't forgive them, your life is ruined in bitterness. Okay, so if someone sins against you, you must forgive them. But we're talking about reconciliation here. And for reconciliation, yes, you need forgiveness, but you also need change. There has to be repentance, turning away from, from the thing that caused the, um, the breakup in the first place. And so to mend this relationship, there, there needs to be real repentance, a changed heart. And that's what Joseph is working out by setting up these tests. And there's three of them, three tests. And uh, I mean, when you look at all of this, that is such an amazing expression of love from Joseph. It's an amazing expression of kindness after all his brothers had done to him, 
Now, Joseph is actually the one who is moving toward them to heal the past. It's an amazing expression of love. You know, there's no anger in Joseph. The, when, he, when he treats them harshly, that's all just a front. And yet the whole time, underneath, he's almost breaking down in tears. The whole way through, has to turn away and cry at the situation. And so there's no anger, no resentment. Instead, they're just tests. Are these brothers willing to change? Can there be reconciliation? Okay, well, let's look. What does Joseph learn through these three tests? Let's have a look at each in turn. Uh, first of all, there is the spy test, which is in chapter 42. Remember, Joseph accuses them of being spies and he has Simeon locked up in prison. He makes the rest of them go back and get Benjamin. What does Joseph learn through that test? He learns that the brothers are guilty, that they feel that guilt. Through this test, they're actually forced to deal with their guilt. Uh, that's their guilt of sinning against Joseph. And it turns out that, that the guilt of what they did to Joseph, that's been gnawing away at them for the last 20 years. That whole time that they couldn't shake it up, uh, shake it off. And now with Simeon locked up in prison, and with that warning, you will not see my face again unless you bring Benjamin back. All of a sudden, the, the guilt, it becomes overwhelming. Have a look at verse 21 in chapter 42. Look at what they say. Chapter 42, verse 21, they said to one another, Surely we are being punished because of our brother. We saw how distressed he was when he pleaded with us for his life, but we would not listen. That's why this distress has come upon us. I don't know if you can get your minds around that, but, you know, trouble comes upon them and the first thing they think about is something that happened 20 years ago. What does that show you? It shows you that what they did has been weighing upon them ever since. The, the, the guilt of what they did. And so for 20 years they've trying to, tried to put it away. They've tried to bury the past. They've tried to forget about what happened. And yet they couldn't. Perhaps they even struggled to sleep some nights, you know, when you try to sleep and there's that little moment between being awake and asleep, you know that moment when all of the things you worry about <laughs> come flooding in and then you can't get to sleep? Maybe that's what they went through for 20 years. They get to that point and all that they can do is hear the screams of their little brother from that pit that they threw him in. No matter how much they tried to escape their guilt, it just followed them around like a lonely dog. It actually sounds like Psalm 32. Do you know Psalm 32? It's a prayer of confession written by David after he had sinned. And uh, David writes this in verse 3 and 4. When I kept silent, that is silent about my sin, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. David is describing the experience of guilt. That's what the brothers were experiencing for 20 long years. They were guilty. They had committed a real sin. And as a result, as the psalm says, God's hand was heavy upon them. And God kept it there. He didn't let them become comfortable with what they did. That is a sign of God's mercy. God could have looked at what the brothers did and thought, oh, fine, if that's the way you want to live... Go for it. You can ruin your life. Experience all the consequences of living like that. But instead, God loved these men. He had his hand on them. He pressed upon them for 20 long years so they couldn't get any relief. No peace, no comfort. God could have easily just took his hand away, let them shut down their own consciences. They could have become seared, as the New Testament describes it. He could have allowed them to harden their hearts, to become like a rock. But he doesn't. Because he loves them, he is merciful to them, and they are forced, finally, after 20 years, they're forced to actually deal with their guilt, to confront it, 
to stop trying to run away from it. And the irony is that Joseph is right there listening to everything they say, to the, to the, the pain that they're, they're experiencing through their guilt. And uh, in verse 24, it says that he, he turned away from them and began to weep. It's the first time he's heard how they felt about what they did. That's the spy test. Uh, the second test is the money test. Uh, sorry, the, the meal test. Uh, and that's in chapter 43. Because the second time the brothers arrive in Egypt, this time with Benjamin, uh, they, they are taken to Joseph's house. And you know they're so shake, shaken up about the way Joseph treated them last time that they're totally convinced in their mind that the reason Joseph is taking them to their house is because he's got a whole heap of soldiers just waiting in there so that as soon as they all walk in the door, bang, they'll pounce on them, tie them all up, make them slaves. And so they're going there, wetting their pants in fear, and they enter the room and they get the shock of their lives. There before them is a table, ready for a meal. A banquet in the middle of a famine. And uh, to their astonishment, these brothers are seated by the servants in the exact order of their ages. Okay, there's 11 men and they're seated from oldest to youngest in that order. And they're looking at each other going, what is going on? How on earth could this Egyptian stranger know how old we are? And so they're absolutely gobsmacked. And, um, but the way they're seated, that becomes the context for the test. Okay, the test is actually in verse 34 of chapter 43. Have a look at that. Verse 34. Uh, so they're all, they're all being served their meal. And it says that when um, portions were served to them from Joseph's table... Benjamin's portion was five times as much as anyone else's. <laughs> so they feasted and drank freely with him. Yeah. Five times as much. Now, normally, in that culture, the oldest brother would receive the biggest portion. But here the youngest brother receives the biggest portion. And <laughs> it was obvious that that had been done on purpose because they knew who the oldest brother was. He was sitting up the other end of the table. But here the youngest gets it. But what's Joseph doing there? I can remember thinking to myself, you know, years ago when I read this, oh, that's right, that's because Joseph likes Benjamin the most. And so he's saying, you know, here you go, buddy. But he's not actually doing that. This is a test. What Joseph is doing here is he's putting his brothers in the same situation that they were in now, 22 years ago, 22 years ago, the son of Jacob's favourite wife, Rachel, received preferential treatment. Okay? He, was show, he was shown favouritism. And the brothers hated it. You know when Jacob made that coat for Joseph? And that just made them so angry, so bitter. Here they are, they're all seated. We know who the oldest is, we know who the youngest is. And yet this son of Rachel <laughs> is receiving all the preferential treatment. Do you see what Joseph's doing? He's putting them in a situation that will arouse those old feelings of jealousy and anger, resentment. Would it do that? Have these brothers changed? Do they still have that resentment for the favourite son? Well, they'll have opportunity to show that in the third test. Okay, in the third test, which is the cup test, and that's at the end of uh, chapter 44. Uh, and, okay, so this is the third and final test, and it's, it's the most skillful test. This is an absolute stroke of genius on Joseph's behalf. And that this final test, this third test, it will show Joseph without a doubt whether his brothers are, ch are willing to change. And so what he does, uh, as we mentioned in the plot line, uh, he has his silver cups secretly slipped into Benjamin's sack. Uh, 
And uh, Benjamin is caught red-handed, well, kind of, because he didn't actually steal it. Um, but he's been framed, and they're all dragged before Joseph. And let's have a look what they say. Uh, have a look at chapter 44, verse 15. Actually, we'll read from verse 14. Uh, Joseph was still in the house when Judah and his brothers came in, and they threw themselves to the ground before him. Joseph said to them, What is this you have done? Don't you know that a man like me can find things out through divination? Verse 16. What can we say to my Lord? Judah replied. What can we say? How can we prove our innocence? God has uncovered your servant's guilt. What's Judah referring to there? God has uncovered your servant's guilt. Are they guilty for stealing a cup? No, they're innocent. They're referring to another guilt. The guilt of what they did to Joseph 22 years ago. Anyway, he goes on to say, We are now, my Lord's slaves, we ourselves and the one who was found to have the cup. But Joseph said, Far be it from me to do such a thing. Only the man who was found to have the cup will become my slave. The rest of you, go back to your father in peace. Do you realise what Joseph has done with this test? He says, I only want one of you to stay. Just one to become a slave. The rest of you, you can go free. Does that remind you of anything? Do you see what Joseph has done? He has put his brothers in exactly the same situation they were in 22 years ago, out at Dotham. Remember, the favourite son was isolated. The favourite son was abandoned. Left as a slave, they all went home free to their father. Joseph has put them in exactly the same situation. He is giving them the chance to commit the crime all over again. All that they have to do is abandon Benjamin and they're free. They can go home in peace. But what do they do? They refuse to do it. They will not do it. They refuse to, to abandon Benjamin at all costs. They would rather be slaves with him than to go home without him. But the real climax of the story is actually in the speech that Judah makes um, here at this point. Judah of all people. See, Judah, if you can remember, he was the ringleader in Joseph's betrayal. He was the most cold-hearted one. Uh, he was the one who came up with the plan of selling Joseph as a slave. And we learned, well, we skipped chapter 38, but chapter 38 showed us that he was a really messed up fellow. He had no regard for the Lord. He was living like a pagan. And yet here, we see Judah is a changed man. He's different. And you can see it in his speech. It's in, in chapter 44, verses 18, uh, down to 34. Do you see how long the speech is? It's actually the longest speech recorded in Genesis. And you can tell what the speech is all about because 14 times Joseph says a word that shows us what the speech is all about. It's the word Father. Joseph, uh, sorry, not Joseph, Judah. Judah's speech is all about his concern for his father. And so he says to Joseph, Please, Mr Prime Minister, you need to understand that our father really loves this younger son. And if we go back to Egypt without, uh, sorry, if we go back to Canaan without him, you need to realise our father will actually die. He says in verse um, 30, If the boy is not with us when I go back to your servant, my father, and if my father, whose life is closely bound up with the boy's life, sees that the boy isn't there, he will die. He says that Jacob's life is closely bound up with the boy. Do you know that's exactly how you could describe J Jacob's relationship to Joseph 22 years ago? Closely bound up with the boy? And so you'd expect that, that Judah would be just as jealous of Benjamin as he was of Joseph all those years ago, and yet he has changed. God has done something in this man's life. 
He's made this fellow a new creation. And Judah makes the most amazing offer at this point. Uh, Have a look at verse 33. Now then, please let your servant remain here as my Lord's slave in place of the boy and let the boy return with his brothers. How can I go back to my father if the boy is not with me? No, do not let me see the misery that would come upon my father. That there is a complete 180 degree turnaround in Judah's life. 22 years ago, he couldn't care less about what misery he brought to his father. Couldn't care less about the favorite son. Couldn't care less about Jacob. After all, Jacob loved Joseph more than he did. Now Jacob loves Benjamin more than he loves Judah. But Judah has put all of that away. He's put away all the resentment. And now he says he would rather give his own life than to see his father go through the kind of misery that he went through when he lost Joseph. Judah says he would rather sacrifice himself for the one that his father loves more than him. And so Judah offers himself as a sacrifice for his brothers, but for the sake of his father. And what is that? That is the fruit of true repentance. Judah is a new man. And that means that he's passed the test. He has passed the test. Remember, Joseph, he wants to reconcile with his brothers. He he wants to see, are these fellows different? Are they willing to change? And through these tests, and especially in Judah's willingness to sacrifice himself for Benjamin, that's exactly what Joseph sees. He sees real repentance. And it's, that's, that's why it's at that point. Look at chapter 45, verse 1. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before, before all his attendants. And he cried out, have everyone leave my presence. And uh, he was crying, you know, so loudly. And verse 3, I am Joseph. I am your brother. This is the point where he tells them because he's seen the repentance. They can reconcile. And it's at this point of the story that we actually see the meaning of all of this for us today. See, Joseph's dealings with his brother, with his brothers, it's a wonderful picture of the way God deals with us. Now, like Joseph, God is far more ready to forgive us than we are ever ready to confess our sin. God is, like Joseph, far more ready and willing to reconcile with us than we are to come back to him. God is eager to grant mercy, even though we are the ones who have done so much against him. And how do we know God is like that? How do we know that God is so ready to reconcile with us? The answer is... Because another Judah has come. Another Judah has come. One in the line of Judah. One from the tribe of Judah. One who offered himself as a sacrifice in your place because of his great love for the Father. See, what we learn here is that there is actually one greater than Joseph who is ready to forgive us because one greater than Judah has come and given his life in our place. Jesus Christ. See, God is ready to reconcile with you. He has sent the ultimate Judah. What do you need to do? You need to repent. You need to confess your sin. You need to turn back to him. That's what we learn here. But that's not the only thing we learn about God from the actions of um, Joseph. The way Joseph treated his brothers, by putting them through all of these tests, you know, to to get to reconciliation, that's exactly what God does with us. Right? In this passage, there's actually a story behind the story. The story behind the story is that we have here a family with 12 brothers, and these 12 brothers are the basis, 
of God's people in the world. Okay, the 12 tribes of Israel. Here they are, the very foundation of the 12 tribes of Israel, and they're an absolute mess. They are an absolute mess. And now they're scattered halfway across the world. And so the story behind the story is that God is bringing them back together to be a family once again. But for that to happen, there needs to be repentance. There has to be a changed heart. And the only way for that to happen is for these brothers to experience God's fatherly discipline. They have to go through pain. There's no other way they'll listen. There's no other way they'll come back other than pain. That's God's discipline. And that's, that's exactly what God does in every one of his children. Everyone he loves. It says in Proverbs 3 that God disciplines those he loves. And why does he do that? He does that so we will turn back to him. God disciplines us so that we don't keep going in our sin, so that we don't keep following that foolish path and experience all the consequences of life without God. And God disciplines us so that we actually become more like him because he calls us to be the channel of his blessing in the world. The promise God made to Abraham... Through you, all nations will be blessed. How is that going to happen? He has to bring them to repentance. And as we've seen through the life of Joseph, that's exactly what God did in Joseph's life, and Joseph embraced it with both hands. He clung on to that, that no matter how painful his life was, no matter what people did to him, he looked to the greater purpose, beyond the pain, to what God was doing, and Joseph embraced that and he was a changed man. The same thing is happening in the brothers' lives. Those tests that Joseph put his brothers through, God was doing a work in his brothers through them. That no matter how painful it was for them, God's purpose overruled. And that's the same thing that God is doing in your life today. In the pain you go through. As we've been learning in the story of Joseph... The worst things that can happen to you aren't the worst things that happen to you can only fulfill God's good purpose for you. Do you believe that? See, that's what Joseph had learned uh, over those 22 years. And so if you have a look at verse um, verse 5 in chapter 45. He says to the brothers and now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now there has been a famine in the land and for the next five years there won't be any ploughing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then it was not you who sent me, but God sent me here. Okay, the worst thing that could happen to Joseph in God's purpose was the best thing not only for Joseph but for the whole family and for the whole earth. Okay, the reason why we're here today is because of God's purpose. That through the tribe of Judah came the Messiah who gave his life to save us from sin. Right, And God's good purpose He's at work in everyone that he loves. He disciplines those he loves. And so the, the response to this um, passage from all of you needs to be repentance. Don't keep running from God. Don't keep turning your back on God. If you belong to him, God will just keep turning up the heat until you turn away from whatever it is that, that is coming between you and him. And you need to embrace that. Because that is God's love for you. And the proof that he loves you is he gave his own son. And so be reconciled to God. Give up your sinful ways. Turn back to him. Because he is ready and willing to forgive. Let's pray.